All right, Dr. Ogbons, thank you so much for making the time. I want to begin with the threat that ECOWAS made on Friday, threatening military intervention in Niger if the ousted president, Mohamed Bazoum, was not restored into power. It's Sunday, the deadline that they set, nothing has happened, but that threat appeared to escalate the situation. What do you make of ECOWAS's threat? Yeah, thank you, uh, Hamela, for having me on your uh, channel today. The threat is real, and uh, it's not something that anyone should take lightly. Um, and some of us believe, analysts, that the, the ECOWAS, even though that threat was hurriedly made, uh, it was quite reactionary, to be honest. Uh, and there is a high probability that there could be a military intervention. And the reason, is, the reason for this is not far-fetched. Most of the decision makers at the level of the authority of heads of state at the ECOWAS, these are all democratically elected uh, government. So a lot of them, they are trying to be proactive and knowing where African countries are coming from. Uh, in the last 60 years, we've had over 200 military coups in Africa and over 70% of these have been successful. So they are also looking at themselves. Could this play out in, in our own countries? So most of the reaction you are seeing now is more of a self-preservation for most of these African presidents or prime ministers or whatever designation they are using. So the threat is real. So let's talk about the sentiment on the ground. What do the people on the ground actually think about the coup? Oh, if, if, if we are to go by that, the sentiment on the ground right there on the street of Niami, in uh, Alit, and some other regions of Niger, uh, there will actually be no need for this military intervention from the ECOWAS uh, bloc. The Nigerians are very happy uh, with, with the uh, military coup leaders. Uh, they have received them warmly. As uh, you can see from the reports we are getting from the international media and from local media right there in, uh, from Africa, zooming to us, all over the world, you can see that there's been a lot of uh, pro uh, cool protests in support, in solidarity with the military junta. And the reason for this is not far-fetched. A lot of Nigerians feel that the ousted uh, regime, or the, the ousted government of uh, President Mohamed Bazoum, uh, have not been fair to them. Um, although this was the very first time that uh, Nigerians are having successful democratic transition from one civilian government to the other uh, in their history, since they got independence from France in 1960, they feel that the democratic government have not been beneficial to them. Because what they see, the average Nigerian, if you speak to them, is the fact that these uh, politicians in Niger, they are only just looking after themselves. So there's a kind of a euphoria, if, if I want to put it that way, within the average uh, Nigerian population. So there's a lot of support. And we've seen those videos of what you describe as euphoria. And along with that are people flying the Russian flag along with the Nigerian flag. And there is this anti-colonial sentiment that's directed at the U.S. and France in these uh, protests as long as 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 well as these videos that are coming from neighboring leaders, you know, what do you think that's about? What is it that Russia is providing that the people don't think the U.S. or France is providing? Thank you very much, uh, Hamela. Uh, the truth of the matter is, when you look at the geopolitical order uh, in the African continent. There is a lot of power play. There's a lot of intrigues. And um, analysts like us who have done a lot of research, you know, Af African study, governance and leadership, sometimes we, we are able to read between the lines. Since independence 63 years ago from uh, former colonial master of France, the, the French have had a very strong foothold on the Social, political, economic development of Niger. We could stretch this to some other francophone countries in Africa. So, 
But there have, also, there have also been, over time, a lot of anti-French sentiment, anti-West sentiment in, in Niger and some of these other countries. So principally for Niger, what has happened in the last uh, five years has been a rise in anti-French sentiment because of the level of poverty. If you look at uh, some data, available data, Niger is sitting pretty. I shouldn't be using the word sitting pretty now, in quote. 189 global index out of 189. Niger is officially the poorest country in the world. So when you just oppose this against the vast amount of mineral resources in Niger, so you begin to ask questions. So where are these resources going to? Who are those using these resources? So the Nigerians feel that they are politicians, those in government, their political leadership, they kind of connive you know, with their uh, Western government collaborators, the French, the Americans, even to some extent, the British and some other EU countries who need these mineral resources, especially uranium, to power their uh, nuclear power plant. So these are some of the political economic dynamics that is playing out and which this coup, this military coup that happened on the 26th of July has highlighted uh, to the entire world. Some of these things will be hidden and not many people know about it, but they are coming to the fore. And let's not forget, there is an ongoing crisis between Russia and Ukraine, on which the West is very much involved with, as in supporting Ukraine. So the Russians too are uh, under uh, heavy sanctions, so they too are also looking for new alliances. They are also trying to make inroads to Africa. And if you notice, last week, there was um, a Russia-African summit, you know, in Petersburg, in Russia, where uh, President uh, Putin hosted a number of African uh, leaders. And there were a lot of uh, bilateral uh, relations, uh, economic agreements that were reached. And finally, on this question, let me just quickly uh, hint that apart from Niger, you will see that the neighboring countries along the Sahel region, uh, coming from Chad to Guinea, Burkina Faso, and Mali, apart from Chad, and I will explain that briefly, the other countries are also under military rule as we speak. And they also receive this warm recession from their citizens. So for Chad, the current president was even installed by the military, even though the, 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 the father was, uh, was killed. So the military installed him, uh, the son of uh, Idris Derby. So these are the scenarios that we have presently in that region. So do you think this change is going to transfer to good progress or economic progress to the people, or is it going to turn into just a power struggle where maybe the, the, the riches switch hands, but it won't actually spread to the people in terms of economic growth, 189 out of 189? I mean, do the people just feel like they have nothing to lose, or could this kind of a conflict actually create more problems? I think um, some of the likely possibilities, I would just uh, enumerate them. Number one, um, as is often the case in Africa, um, truth is there is no justification for the military incursion into uh, democratic governance. But as far as Africa is concerned and as far as Niger is concerned, it is what it is at the moment. Um, this, you know, like we say, this romantic blues as for the, between the Nigerian citizens and the military junta, it, it, will, it will blow away, it will go off at some point. That is one side. Then secondly, there could also be counter coup because I don't think with what uh, is happening in the Western world, I don't think they will just sit down, fold their hands and allow this current junta to have their way, especially with the anti-French sentiment and the embrace of Russia. Like you said, uh, earlier, you, you, we all saw the, the burning, the attack on the French embassy in Niami and the burning of the French flag and the raising up of uh, the Russian flag. So I, I believe that the, the Western powers will also be, be looking at what they can do. But 
what we all hope is that in all this, uh, there should be peace, there should be carnage, because the world is grappling with the Russian-Ukraine crisis at the moment, and it's having a lot of impact uh, on everyone. So we hope there will be peace, and this crisis will be uh, settled amicably uh, without uh, the firing of any bullets or throwing of any, any missile. And last question for you, Dr. Agbans. The videos that we saw from Guinea and Mali and some uh, messages from uh, Algeria and Burkina Faso really stood behind uh, Niger and, and warned about military intervention into the country. Were you surprised to see that level of uh, unity among these countries' leadership? And is there something about that that's new that we haven't seen before? Um, I would say on a scale of uh, 1 to 10, uh, I didn't expect that level of uh, support from the countries you just uh, outlined. Uh, especially Algeria, who have said, um, even though they don't support the coup, but they also do not support uh, military intervention. You know, so that has been really, really huge. Then, when you look at Nigeria, which is the biggest uh, player in the uh, ECOWAS block, Nigeria is currently um, holding the chairmanship of the ECOWAS. So, there is also a problem. Nigeria too has been grappling with, you know, uh, insurgency, banditry, and a lot of problem with insecurity in the northeast, northwest, you know, of that country. So there's a lot of challenges. So a lot of Nigerians are not even in support. As we speak, yesterday, the uh, Nigerian parliament, the Senate, they rejected uh, the, 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 the current president of Nigeria, his request, uh, for, for them to approve uh, military intervention in Niger. So this, this is just what is playing out at the moment. So um, for the support from Mali, Burkina Faso, and Guinea, I will say that um, they mean business. And looking at the level of cooperation between these four countries now, that we, are, we are talking of Mali, Guinea, Burkina Faso, and Niger, they will really form a big alliance. And you can see they are already recalling uh, their ambassadors from uh, Nigeria, from the U.S., from France, and another Western nation. And there is this embrace towards uh, Russia. So it's a kind of uh, when opportunity comes, you take it as far as the Russian side is concerned. You know, the U.S. says it, it gives about $2 billion in aid every year to Niger. There are 1,000 U.S. troops in Niger, and there are experts that are saying if Niger is lost, it's really a huge U.S. loss and, and uh, a win for Russia. With all this aid, and yet, as you mentioned, the country is 189 out of 189, even though they are uh, resource rich. What do you make of those figures? Two billion dollars in aid and yet still the poorest country in the world based on most metrics. Yeah, thank you very much. Two billion dollar worth of aid it goes back to what we, we, we said earlier in this discussion. So where are those resources going to? Obviously, we know it's, it's a level of corruption in, in Niger. The political elite in that, in that country, they just, you know, feeding fat. Why uh, the huge majority of the population, they are in uh, abject poverty, multidimensional poverty, uh, as far as Niger is concerned. So that is the thing. So that is the problem. So what I think the, the Western nations, after all this crisis, they also need to have a rethink. They need to have a review. And, you know, and like we have always said, a lot of uh, people from Africa feel that the West is not doing enough dealing with corrupt government, government officials. They are very quick to condemn uh, military incursion, but people are asking that they should be quicker, you know, in also ensuring that those political elites, those political exposed uh, uh, leaders of this African nation, Niger inclusive, they should also be you know, restricted from going away with uh, the resources that is meant for everybody. So this is the situation at the moment. So once this euphoria, as you described it, dies, are you concerned the political elite that you uh, just referred to are going to hijack this transition? Yeah, it's a possibility. And like I said, they could also want to organize their counter coup. We've seen all this play out uh, in the continent of Africa before now. Uh, but 
like we said, we, we just believe that it will not get to that stage. Usually, some of these uh, military coup, when they happen, the soldiers uh, will just say, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll set up a transitional government, maybe we'll hand over in two years, three years. Uh, sometimes it could even be extended. But I think, ultimately, um, the international community should also you know, listen to the voice of the citizens of Niger. What is it that they really want? What is it that is happening in Niger? What are the problems besetting that landlocked uh, country? Because Niger, even though with a population of about 25 million, um, has GDP of uh, just about 15 um, you know, million dollars, which is about in pounds sterling here in the UK, just a little above uh, 12 million pounds, which is, uh, is really nothing to, to write home about. Dr. Agbans, thank you so much for your insight. I really appreciate your time. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure.